Uh, Vice Chair Kappelman. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Commissioner, thank you for all the work that you're doing. I mean, it, it, it's hard. Um, uh, the commissioner and I had a, a difficult conversation last Friday, um, but I'll, I'll give a little bit of background. Um, I have uh, several homeless shelters within a few blocks of my home and my neighborhood also has four nursing homes for people living with chronic mental illness. There's also an apartment building that provides uh, 50 units of harm reduction housing for people who have a mental illness along with an active drug addiction. Uh, and I also have, I believe around 30 people sleeping under the viaducts a few blocks away under Lakeshore Drive at Lawrence and Wilson. Um, these are people who are very resistant to going to a shelter. A, non a number of these individuals uh, staying under the viaducts were kicked out of the shelters and nursing homes in the area due to uh, their behavior, which may have led to some of their resistance to a referral to a shelter. And some of them aren't, they're not allowed to return. Um, DFSS did go out there early this year in 2020 uh, to do some intensive outreach for 20 consecutive days, I believe, and learned that many of them would only leave if they could go all together as a group to a low barrier shelter. Uh, and it had to be an uptown. Uh, for many of you who don't know what low barrier shelters are, um, they're great because they, uh, they don't have rules about sobriety and, and pets and unmarried couples are able to stay together. Um, so not having the resources to put in an eighth homeless shelter in the area, we weren't able to accommodate their, their demands. Um, it's also a little awkward because Lakeshore Drive is a US highway. So staying there violates a few federal laws, including the American Disabilities Act, which when the public way is blocked. Um, DFSS went out there again. Um, they could, they're not gonna give up uh, a few months ago and did another round of outreach to them. Uh, this time they refused any option of even going to a low barrier shelter, instead uh, demanded placements and apartments that had to be located in the area where they've established their support system. You know, and, and I don't blame them. Um, as you know, commissioner, that's our conversation we had was that there's an extreme lack of affordable housing for people earning less than 15% of the AMI and I've, always been in support of expanding that program. And the, and the 46 Ward has a disproportionate number of those units and we want more. Um, Lawrence Avenue at the Lakeshore Drive has four lanes of traffic going in and off the drive. So a bike lane and pedestrian lanes were placed uh, on each side of Lawrence Avenue under the viaducts to make it safe for, um, for people to get to and from the lake. Around 50% of the residents don't own a car. So it's, they walk. Um, the pedestrian lanes on both sides now contain tents. So pedestrians now use the bike lanes to get to and from the lakefront and bicyclists, bicyclists and runners now use the street. Um, I went to this site yesterday and saw three vans blocking the westbound traffic off Lakeshore Drive to do a cookout for the people living under the viaducts. You know, they certainly need to eat. Um, many of those people living under the viaducts were congregating outside their tents and these individuals weren't wearing masks. I don't blame them because I don't wear a mask in my own home. So how can I expect them to wear a mask in theirs? So this means that pedestrians have to make a decision on whether to walk through crowds of people who aren't wearing masks or do they walk in car traffic? Um, and with the vans blocking one of these lanes, this means that we have one lane of traffic for cars leaving Lakeshore Drive that's also shared with bicyclists and uh, some pedestrians. Um, some may suggest that people who walk in the car traffic don't feel comfortable being around people experiencing homelessness. I, I took in people experiencing homelessness in my own home when I was in my 20s and 30s, and I once founded a homeless shelter for injecting drug users with HIV, some who were self-medicating due to their own mental illness. But last May, as the murder of George Floyd just started hitting the news. I was admitted for a four day hospital stay for surgery. I have another procedure in a few weeks. So I walk in the street to get to the lakefront because I, I can't take the chance of being around a crowd of people not wearing a mask. I witnessed parents with children riding their bikes with training wheels going in the street to avoid encampments filled with people not wearing masks. So my question is, 
how do I meet the needs of the surrounding community who want access to the lakefront in a safe manner while also meeting the needs of the people who are distrustful of going to a homeless shelter or nursing home, especially after many of them were kicked out? Alderman, is that a question for me, sir? Um, for anyone who can come up with any answer, I'm desperate. So, um, so first of all, Alderman, Alderman Kappelman, um, there are a handful of aldermen that for the five years I've been here, I have consistently talked with all year long, every year about homelessness. Um, Alderman Kappelman is one, Alderman Dow is one, Alderman Osterman is one. There are a number of folks that we, we've got each other on speed dial and we do this a lot. Um, and yes, we did have a challenging conversation on Friday. I recognize, let me start by saying that I recognize when constituents and taxpayers are upset about homelessness, I recognize they don't call me, they call you, they call all of you all. So that's why we show up at your town hall meetings if you ask us to, it's why we answer your questions if you ask us to, but we are the city Schumann and social service funder. We are not enforcers. We are funding nonprofit agencies that are staffed by clinical social workers. We ourselves have clinical social workers on our payroll. And so when we go out to engage homeless individuals, we are there to try to break through the mistrust that they have. And we offer them the opportunity to engage with services or to go into shelter. Those are the tools we have in our toolkit. Um, Many times, as the alderman indicated, they will turn us down and we will continue to go back because sometimes it is a matter of how often and how long you engage them before they finally say yes. But it is challenging because it is not illegal to be homeless in the state of Illinois or the city of Chicago. Um, and we are not the enforcement department. If there are vehicles that have pulled up to feed someone, then that means there are also folks, there are police cars moving around through those same viaducts that need to move that traffic along. Um, that is not what DFSS does and it's not what the agencies that we fund do. Having said that, what we do with, when we do these uh, intensive encampments is we're working across the departmental line. So I'm not even, I, Alderman Kappelman knows, I don't leave him out there exposed by himself and simply say, I don't do that work. So we come, to, we come to the table with the, the local district commander. We come to the table with the, the superintendent from Streets and Sands to talk about cleaning. And we do this ward by ward. Um, this is challenging because there is not enough truly affordable housing for people existing at zero to 15% of the AMI. And without truly affordable housing, and the money that supports the services that these people often need that Alderman Kappelman speaks so passionately about, um, what DFSS does is we move them from one side of the street to the other. And don't get me wrong, I recognize there's value in that sometimes, which is why we show up to do it. So we don't mind going up to disrupt the 30 people living under the viaduct, but until I've got a place for them to go, that's essentially what we're doing. We show up every so often, we do a deep, uh, a, a deep encampment initiative and we, you know, we have um, some level of success, but clearly, sir, not enough to really relieve you of the pressure I know you are under from your own constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, if I may, uh, Vice Chair, is it something specific that you may need or like additional mask or or other PPE equipment that you may need? Is it something like that? In addition to what Commissioner Butler just spoke of? Um, we gave a, a lot of masks to the area shelters and nursing homes and we gave them to groups who distributed um, those masks. But, but, you know, I'll be honest, I, I don't wear a mask in my house. I'm not wearing a mask now. Uh, these individuals, when they leave their tents and they're congregating and because they formed a sense of community, they don't wear masks. This is their house. Um, so we don't know what to do. And I, I mean, I, I will not walk 
down that that path. I, I do walk in the street and I I make sure cars aren't going to hit me when I go to the lakefront. I, I, I don't know an answer. I think part of what we have to do, uh, Chairman Sawyer, is to continue, um, despite sometimes how just emotionally grueling this work is, because like Alderman Kappelman is suggesting, we've been up to that viaduct two times this year and done really intensive initiatives. And as much as I enjoy working with Alderman Kappelman, his is not the only ward where there are encampments. And so we can't put 100% of our efforts up there. Um, but that doesn't mean I think we have to continue to show up when these encampments start to kind of tip into being super large. I think we have to continue to try to put the pressure on across departments to make sure that everyone else does what they're supposed to do. If you catch homeless people breaking the law, that is an enforcement issue. We need CPD to help us with that. If you, if you have an encampment and the trash is piling up, we need streets and sand to help us with that. So we have to continue, which we do, to keep the pressure on the sister departments and, and they are responsive when we ask them to. I do think it's hard for CPD right now to enforce on this. They've been very busy, they are stretched very thin. And when you look at the pressure they are under right now and the, the, the beating that their reputation has taken generally, I don't think they're eager to weigh in on every homeless person who may be blocking the right of way. Um, unfortunately, enforcement is their job. And so if they don't do it, I don't know who will. Um, I also think to your question, uh, Chairman Soria, that we have to continue as we've done to do the volunteer drives for supplies, et cetera, to keep those um, PPE, the, at least that kind of stuff um, available to people. And then I also think the last thing is this, this partnership with um, uh, CDPH is crucial because we know that constituents in general are worried about whether or not there is a higher incidence of COVID wherever you see uh, homeless people. So we've got to remain really focused on that to make sure that we keep the positivity rates low. Thank you. What further complicates it is that when someone is blocking the public way, you know, which is against the law, or when tents are erected without a permit, which is against the law, when the ADA is not being followed, which is against the law, the police do go out and they can they can issue a, an ANOF, a notice of violation. But I have seen police officers give ANOFs to individuals living on the streets and the individual just look at the police officer, tear the ticket up right in front of the police officer, throw it away. I mean, the, the officer, is an officer going to take a person living on the streets into jail? I, they're not. So it's it's an extraordinarily complicated situation. And I and I really don't know the answer. All right. Well, um, you know, I sympathize with you on that, Vice Chair. Uh, but like I said, if it was something that we could do on a community wide basis, I would be more than happy to provide whatever assistance we could. Uh, if it's related to additional equipment or things like that. But I know that's a very touchy situation. I, I wonder, Chairman Sawyer, um, if there are, I think one of the things we might all consider that I, that I would ask you all to kind of sleep on is I think that there is a lot of misinformation out there about homelessness. And I also think maybe there isn't a real appreciation for the impact of COVID on these, uh, on these individuals. And I wonder if there's not an opportunity for us to kind of embrace a, a more general education campaign and get the information that you lap, that Carmelo shared, to share that more broadly. I think Chicagoans in general um, deserve to understand the impacts of COVID and the kinds of things that we might be seeing in the months and weeks to come. Um, but the you. real solution, what experts say across the country, housing, housing, housing especially for those, as, as the commissioner said, for those individuals who are between zero and 15% of the AMI. When we do on-site affordable housing for up zones, that goes to people who earn 60% of the AMI. For someone living on the streets, that's like hitting the lottery. They never qualify for that. And, and that's what we're desperate on and, and we don't have it. All right, All right thank you. Uh, 